Okay, here we go. Thank you everybody for joining us um, for our capstone event for Women's History Month 2021. My name is Vivian Wu. I'm a college alum from the class of 2008 and an ANHW outreach um, director. This will be an interactive session, especially towards the end. So may I recommend, uh, please keep yourself muted for um, the first half of the event, but feel free to unmute when it's time for audience Q&A. And I also suggest that um, you turn on the speaker view, which is the um, in the upper right-hand corner of Zoom, there's um, a tic-tac-toe grid and you can choose either gallery view or speaker view. Um, since we're doing a Zoom meeting format so that people can participate, you know, if it's less distracting, uh, speaker view can help you know, expand the person who is currently speaking. Okay, so first I want to introduce um, and thank our live speakers. We have um, three live speakers today, and I will introduce them uh, via alphabetical order by first name. Uh, Kesha Ram, MPA class of 2018, is a state senator from the state of Vermont. Lauren Sager Weinstein, MPP class of 2002, is the chief data officer uh, for Transport for London and also a board member for the group Women in Transport. Our third live speaker, Theodora Skiatis, um, AB 2012 from the college and MPP class of 2016, is currently a candidate for Cambridge City Council. Uh, so let's have a virtual round of applause for our live speakers. And then I would like to also mention we have two guest appearances. Our first one is um, Congresswoman Catherine Clark, who uh, represents the uh, Massachusetts District 5, which is the um, uh, cities of Melrose and Malden. And she's a MPA class of 97 grad. Uh, we have a short pre-recorded message, which we're about to play right now. And then our um, final guest appearance um, who will uh, come in live around 2 p.m. is Michelle Wu, AB07, HLS12, Boston City Councilor and candidate for mayor. Okay, so now I will share my screen for our, um, sorry, um, for our um, video message from Congresswoman Clark. Um, Okay, wait, let me make sure, sorry, that my sound is on. Um, uh, that, that the sound is uh, playing properly. Hold on, please. Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm Congresswoman Katherine Clark. Thank you for inviting me to join you today to celebrate Women's History Month. As we welcome a new administration and begin the urgent work of the 117th Congress, we are a nation at a crossroads. America faces historic challenges. American women face historic challenges. The pandemic has brought into stark relief so many of the inequities that have plagued our nation. Economic, gender, climate, and racial injustice have been exposed and exacerbated by COVID-19 and its economic fallout. And women are on the front lines of this crisis in hospitals, in grocery stores, in elder care, child care, and at home. It's women who are being pushed out of the workforce at record rates while fighting to keep their families fed, housed, healthy, and hopeful. We are coming face to face with the ramifications of an economy that has long marginalized and devalued women's work. The lack of accessible, affordable childcare, paid family leave, equal pay, and workers' rights have held our economy back and prevented us from fulfilling America's promise. This Women's History Month, while we celebrate the incredible women who've helped shape our nation for the better, we also recognize there is much more work to be done, and we honor the women on our front lines, continuing the march towards equality and justice. 
I am proud to serve alongside a record number of women elected to the 117th Congress, as well as our first woman vice president, Kamala Harris. I never saw myself running for public office, let alone a position in House leadership. But it couldn't be more clear. When women have a seat at the table, families have a voice in Washington. It is from our personal experiences that we draw our passion and purpose, and we will continue to grow our ranks and claim our seat at the table. Because we know when women succeed, America succeeds. Okay, wonderful. So, um, you know, I really, really want to thank the office of Catherine Clark because um, even though she couldn't join us in person, it was so nice for her office to send us that message. And as she kind of um, laid out, there's so much to celebrate, you know, at this moment um, at, at the top of the, um, you know, echelons of leadership in politics and policy, but also the stakes couldn't be higher. The problems couldn't be, um, have more gravitas. So now I'd like to open it for our live speakers to introduce themselves and to offer their perspectives on this moment. Um, also the uh, life experiences and backgrounds that they bring, which inform this intersection of um, you know, women, economic status and public policy. So let's start with Senator Kesha Ram. Thanks so much, Vivian. Um, really nice to be with all of you uh, from what is right now sunny Vermont. It is <laughs> finally spring here um, and the maple sugaring season is almost over. Um, I originally grew up in Los Angeles, so I know I, to most people I don't look like I would be a Vermont state senator and in fact, um, in the Asian American community at large in the country in politics, you know, once in a while when we were in person, someone would meet me and say, we have an Asian woman in Vermont in politics, <laughs> who are you? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm used to sort of um, being discovered up here, but I've been in Vermont now for most of my, uh, my whole adult life and now probably half of my entire life. Um, I, uh, really wanted seasons and trees and clean air and I left and I did not want traffic so people are like how do you deal with the weather I'm like you know what I think I sat in traffic for a long time and thought I don't want this in my life so um I'm here in Vermont I got engaged I'm getting married this uh, summer to a native Vermonter uh, who grew up on a dairy farm and this is my home um, and I started in the legislature when I was, I started my campaign when I was a senior at the University of Vermont. Um, so was not a state senator, then I ran for the House. And the first thing my opponent said was, you know, we'd be curious to know what she thinks she brings to the table. I was challenging two male incumbents. And I thought, oh, that gives me a lot more fire in my belly now <laughs> to show them what I bring to the table. So we, I had about four or 5,000 doors in my district. and. I knocked on every single door twice. Um, I had a lot of students in my district who weren't registered to vote. I registered over a thousand students to vote. Um, and I ended up winning by the largest margin of any challenger in the state that year when I was 22 uh, by the time of the election and started in the legislature. And at the time I was the youngest legislator in the country. Um, it, you know, I've told this story at Harvard many times. So I, I, I feel like most people aren't sick of hearing it, but um, I had actually been, encouraged to run um, a, a couple of years before there was, you know, a, 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 a contested, a hotly contested congressional race, um, or I should say Senate race in 2006. It was when our Congressman Bernie Sanders was running for the US Senate for the first time. And he wanted to have a big event. And this was before he could draw, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to an event. Um, you know, he was he he was just, you know, sort of still an outsider in Vermont politics to some extent. And he wanted a rock star senator, you know, to come join him to kick off his campaign for the Senate. So he got this guy who's who no one could pronounce his name from Illinois. And they said, you know, we need a we need a, a woman to be at the event. It's like the mayor of Burlington, the candidate for Congress, Peter Welch, and then Bernie and this rock star senator. There's no women on stage. So I was a sophomore. And um, they, you know, asked my friend who was running Bernie's campaign on campus said, I know this young woman who's really not afraid to speak up. 
So they asked me if I would introduce the event and we worked on my little speech to kick things off. And there were 7,000 people there and that's like over 1% of the state of Vermont. Um, and I talked about, you know, how if we're not at the table as young people uh, working on student debt and climate change and other issues that are really our burden to bear, um, you know, if we're not given the opportunity to engage and help problem solve with the current generation and leadership, then all of these issues would be resolved on our backs, you know, without us being able to weigh in and, and really bend the arc toward justice, as one might say. So on and on down the, you know, line of speakers, and last was this senator from Illinois, and he started talking about, you know, invoking civil rights leaders, and he said, oh, and I have a father from Kenya and a mother from Kansas. I thought, I have a father from India and a mother from Illinois, and I've never heard a story like mine from a U.S. senator. And, uh, you know, in the middle of all of that, he turns to Bernie and he says, you know what, Bernie, if you don't behave yourself, we're going to run Keisha for the Senate instead of you. And it was the first time anyone encouraged me to run for office. <laughs> and I was just looking around like, did everyone see Barack Obama just said my name? So, um, you know, if you haven't already guessed, uh, it was somebody who became, you know, very formidable uh, candidate while I, you know, was thinking about running myself. And um, two years later, he became the 44th president and I became the youngest legislator in the country. Um, so that's kind of my story of how I got started. And, you know, it was, I, I, a lot of people end up asking, what's it like to run in a place that you didn't grow up? And we can certainly go into all of that. Um, but, you know, I ran for that seat for eight, for eight years. So four terms. And I, then I ran for Lieutenant governor at the age of 29 and it was a big intense and ambitious race <laughs> and you shouldn't be afraid of ambition and I lost that race but I lost very gracefully um and you know I went to governor Madeline Kunin our first and only female governor and she said you know all I can tell you is when I lost a race I went to the Kennedy school and I was like that sounds good to me <laughs> so I did the mid-career program the prestigious midlife crisis as one calls it um went back and you know started doing community work again um people said we really miss you it's like being able to go to your own funeral you're needed in montpelier you, you brought people together that you know you're you're there's a hole where you used to be and so i ran for the senate and i won and still became managed to become uh, the youngest woman in history to serve in the state senate here and now the first woman of color to ever serve in the state senate okay thank you so much for that intro is is there any one particular issue you're very passionate mm -hmm. about you probably said that well it depends on the week <laughs> I mean, not because I, you know, I actually, and I'll, I'll relate this to my Kennedy School experience. I went to the Kennedy School and I thought, let me really dig into the issues that really you, you need like all the thinkers around you to sort of to parse. So it was like educational inequality, income inequality, healthcare economics, you know, just sort of like big topics. So Jason Furman, you know, Obama's former chief economic advisor who's at the Kennedy School was a major mentor for me. Um, you know, I, tried to look deep with opioid issues as a kind of intractable problem, but knowing Boston has a great, you know, healthcare system and a pretty progressive uh, approach to substance uh, treatment. And so, you know, I was sort of trying to dig into the issues I knew I could really take back. But I think overall, what I realized is I'm just so happy as a generalist that I'm just much better off in government, you know, that all of these issues intersect at some level. And what I care the most about is the people who get left behind by, you know, not having representation for hundreds of years or not being part of the, the power structure and the equation. So, you know, I was just tasked with our major unemployment bill yesterday and our major focus was um, joining 13 other states and having a dependent benefit, just recognizing that Vermont's unemployment for women was off the charts and that's even worse for women of color. Um, and so we uh, just, you know, and, and so I was telling folks before you got on the call, I gave this impassioned speech. I, I had texts from senators later saying, oh my God, you really changed people's minds. And it was really great. And right as I finished uh, a, a lightning hit in our Capitol and the power went out and we didn't get to take the vote. So I can't tell you that I was triumphant yesterday, but you know, really it's whatever, um, it's a lot of the intersection of environmental, economic and social justice and who gets left behind most often in our, our policy making. Thank you so much. Next, let's go to Lauren for her intro. Please take it away, Lauren. Hi, uh, thank you for having me and welcome everyone. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my sort of story and my background. And you know, I really like the conversation we've had so far about 
passion and purpose and, and journey. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So I grew up mostly, uh, most of my childhood outside of Washington, DC. Um, my parents weren't in government, but I grew up with friends who had parents in government. And I really sort of saw the potential for public service. Um, and it was something that I was always really interested in. And I thought, okay, this is an area where you can, you know, you can make a difference, you can work hard at something and you can sort of help other people. And that sort of has always been the work that I've done. Um, but in terms of sort of journeys, um, after I graduated from undergrad, I ended up in Los Angeles. Um, and so I, you know, initially I thought actually would work in sort of in sort of in Washington and federal government because that's where I grew up. But I was in Los Angeles um, and really sort of had this passion and this excitement for local government and just sort of discovered the ability to be on the ground and to sort of make a difference and to sort of think about the sort of the sense of place. How could you improve your neighborhood? How could you sort of fix problems? And I worked for the city of Los Angeles. Um, and I worked for a council member. And what I found was is that there were big problems and there's sort of these big problems you want, I wanna tackle, you know, thinking about economics, economic development, how do you help build a sort of a fairer society? And those are sort of big important issues. And then there are the smaller issues that is, are equally important to get right, both in terms of just fixing small things that lead to big things, and also just sort of helping sort of build a trust in government. So I spent my days working on uh, land use planning, working on sort of constituent services just making things sort of work and then um and then i went and did a policy analysis at rand and so i sort of had uh time thinking about how do you do sort of deep policy analysis how do you think about some of these very complex problems and i and i did a range of sort of projects there um, but i really decided at that point i was sort of at this decision point of do i go and, and become a uh, uh someone who sort of does a lot of analysis and go get a you know sort of a very academic track or do I go and be a practitioner? And my heart has always sort of been in the sort of the policy uh, in government and sort of the practitioner side. So I went to the Kennedy School at that point. Um, and, you know, I had had this spark and this excitement about um, you know, sort of local government and particularly because um, as, you said, as, as uh, Senator Keisha mentioned before, traffic is a challenge in LA. Traffic actually, and the sort of, how do you get people from place to place was something with a real interest of mine. And really, you know, how, do, so the, how does the structure of, you know, of a city and how people can connect and, and access one spot of the city to another spot of the city, it has such an impact on sort of the economic development of the city and in particular of the economic opportunities for people. So how can people get to jobs? How can they get to schools? You know, how do they travel to sort of for social and for leisure? And how do you create a sort of a, a, a city that works so that you can sort of create that economic opportunity? And so I focused on that um, at the Kennedy School. And it was sort of one of those just unexpected things that I ended up um, in London. Um, and I thought, uh, I thought, oh, I'll try it out for a year or two. Um, I'd, uh, I'd, st I'd stay and come back to the States, but here I am. Um, I, I joined, uh, I moved to London in 2002, and I, I worked in transport for Transport for London ever since. Um, and, and I'm, you know, really, you know, it's, it's, I love London. It's a great, it's, a, it's sort of a great, exciting city. And I love the sort of the ability to work and to sort of make it make a difference. And that sort of has been my sort of my passion. I've been particularly interested as a sort of the, you know, the, the, first the young woman in the room and then the growing older woman in the room. Um, many times I was the only woman in, in the room. And so one of the things that has been very, very important to me is thinking about how do we change the balance of representation at all levels. Um, so in transport, and so I'm a founding member of our chapter of women in transport. Um, and so how do we sort of encourage uh, and support women as we sort of grow and, and, and develop in that industry. And then I run our data and analytics. And of course, software coding development, um, that's also an industry right now, which is very underrepresented um, with, by women. And that's also something I'm desperate to sort of to change. And so showing the art of the possible and sort of bringing in um, sort of women at all different levels and, and, and having representation is something I'm very passionate about. So I'm, I'm keen to talk about that um, as we sort of go forward this afternoon. Okay, thank you, Lauren. And thank you also for representing a field that is at such a the crux of environmentalism, climate change, um, you know, workers, quality of life and uh, technology. So many, many interesting intersecting uh, topics. 
And uh, our final in-person speaker today is um, Theodora Skiatis. And uh, I guess she represents somebody who's uh, up and coming in politics and policy. So let's give her a warm virtual welcome and have her kick off her intro. Thanks so much, Vivian. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here virtually with you. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your Saturday to join us, especially on as beautiful a Saturday as this. So my name is Theodora Skiatis, but all of my friends call me Theo. Um, I grew up in New York and I spent five consecutive summers when I was in high school uh, in Tijuana, Mexico, helping to build homes for folks without homes as part of my church community. And I was very struck by the contrasting living standards between folks in Tijuana, Mexico, and then San Diego, California, just across the border. And so it inspired in me a desire to get involved in international development efforts all over. So when I moved to Cambridge uh, for college in 2008, I began studying foreign languages and, and foreign cultures. So I ended up taking 50 15 language classes, studying six foreign languages and five different language families. Um, I love etymological discussions. So offline, if every, anyone ever wants to talk with me about language, I, I love it. Um, and so I spent all of my, um, yeah, my, my summers in college abroad. Um, I spent a summer in Costa Rica working in education and working on my Spanish. I spent a summer in Greece working in research and working uh, on my Greek. My family is also Greek American, so my parents are really excited about that particular summer. Um, I spent a summer in Morocco studying Arabic, and then I spent a summer in the West Bank leading summer camps for refugee youth in camps outside of Ramallah, Bethlehem, and Nablus, so a very powerful experience. Um, I then moved after college uh, to Morocco for a year where I worked with NGOs, non-governmental organizations, in conflict resolution, community empowerment, and poverty alleviation uh, in Casablanca and Rabat for a year, um, working with all different different folks um, and also getting to use my French and my Moroccan Dedesha. And then I moved to Turkey for a year where I was teaching in the Southwest of Turkey in a city called Antalya and um, doing research on the barriers to employment for Syrian refugee youth in, in Southeast Turkey and Kurdish Iraq. So I got to learn a good amount of Turkish as well. Um, and it's a really fun language. It, it borrows heavily from Arabic um, because of the Ottoman Empire and the multi hundred, um, yeah, intermingling of peoples in the region. So it was just a really cool um, final language to, to study um, and a really powerful experience as well. So after I spent a year in Turkey, I moved to um, back to Cambridge and I did my MPP at HKS and I was at HKS in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election. I had fully intended to go back abroad, ideally as part of the State Department. So I had written my application essay on my passion for community building and diplomacy and conflict resolution, specifically in places like the Middle East and North Africa, where I had begun to build um, a, a depth of experience. But I was there um, in the lead up to the to the presidential election and it totally transformed the way that I viewed myself as an actor for change domestically. Um, I, I loved the time that I spent working abroad, but I was not an authentic representative of the people there. I'm not Moroccan. Um, while I'm 30% Turkish, I'm not actually from Turkey, I'm not Turkish, um, I'm, I'm American. And so I began a, a two-pronged career is the only way to describe it. Um, so in the years since I've actually had two jobs at the same time because there's just so much work to do. Um, so I spent five years, in, in, the five years since HKS consulting to the federal government, working on issues of foreign policy, specifically affecting the Middle East and North Africa, um, and also Eastern Europe, where I began to study as well. And um, concurrently, I became very invested in the Cambridge community. So I had been living there at that time for six years, but but I was a student. And as you guys probably remember, students are not super engaged in the community. So I read Rob Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, and became totally inspired um, by the thought of helping to grow civil society through um, neighborhood associations as a primary intervention. So um, when I graduated from HKS, the um, Harvard Square Neighborhood Association was just kicking off. And um, 
I joined forces with a bunch of other neighbors and we all started a neighborhood association. At the same time, I had thought about running for office, but I decided that I wasn't ready yet. Um, I hadn't been adequately engaged in the community. So instead I did Emerge, which is a, I recommend to everyone, an incredible program that trains women to run for public office. And I had also done from Harvard Square to the Oval Office when I was at HKS, which I also recommend, a wonderful experience. And with those two experiences, I felt prepared to run a campaign. Um, so I managed a city council campaign for a woman named Sambal Siddiqui, who at the time was running for city council for the first time. Now she's our mayor, and she's also the first Muslim mayor um, of Massachusetts, as well as the first of many. Um, she's a, a very incredible person. And it was a really in, in empowering experience running a campaign from start to finish um, and, and learning about not just the technical details of what it takes to run a campaign, but also like all of the Leslie Nope um, Parks and Rec uh, inspired conversations that evolve on the on the campaign trail. It was it was a really interesting experience. Um, the next year I managed or I helped run Jimmy Tingle's campaign for lieutenant governor, also not a successful race for lieutenant governor, but one that was a really, um, really growing experience as well. And then in the two years since, I have been directing a nonprofit called Cambridge Local First, which is a nonprofit network of locally and independently owned businesses. I'll put a link in the chat. It's a really cool organization. It's called an Independent Business Alliance, and we're part of a network of IBAs operating around the country, all working to amplify local economies. There's a very strong connection to um, to, to social justice, racial justice, because um, small business ownership is the primary vehicle for upward economic mobility for working Americans, and it has been declining in the last few decades. Um, and so it's, it really gets at the heart of the American dream. Um, and, and my family, when they came from Greece, um, all started small businesses. And, and that was how we were able to elevate ourselves socioeconomically. So it's, it's a really important vehicle. Um, and, and there have been many conversations about how business owners of color and women business owners have been disproportionately affected during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've loved the work that I've done there. Um, I'm also now supporting IBAs growing around the country. And um, last but not least, I have a strong connection to women's empowerment um, as the board chair to the YWC at Cambridge, which has the dual mission of empowering women and eliminating racism um, and is the largest provider of housing to single women in Cambridge. And these are women who would otherwise probably not have homes. So it's um, very meaningful work to me. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And of course, I'm so excited to be running for city council now. Thanks for taking some time to join us. Okay, thank you, Theo. And congratulations, of course, on your campaign. Um, I was wondering if you could just uh, encapsulate your reason for running or your platform in like one sentence, what would it be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I would say I'm, I'm running to represent voices that um, are the most vulnerable constituents in Cambridge um, who have inadequate representation on city council. I'm running to empower our locally and independently owned businesses and I'm, I'm fighting for a fair economy, women's empowerment um, and racial justice. Okay. Thank you. Um, so now I, I would love for if the speakers could, um, you know, like popcorn, um, you know, uh, whoever wants to go first can address this, but um, what are you thinking about in this moment for um, like, you know, given all of the um, women who have been, um, you know, um, you know, self-removed or, um, remove themselves or kicked out of the workforce and all of the uh, pressures that are facing women right now in this economic climate. Um, well, what perspectives um, do you have about this topic? Oh, well, I'm happy to start because I'm a senator and we do that, but also <laughs> because, you know, one really interesting thing about my public service is that when I started in the house, it was the start of the Great Recession. So I'm, I kept saying to people, I'm kind of running back into the burning building for a second time. And, you know, one of the things that is important to pay attention to if you were in decision making roles then is that these crises have a very long tail, as we would say. They're not, it's not like you give people some, some unemployment benefits or a boost to go back to work and everything's fine. You know, they have gone into debt. They faced major setbacks. They, their networks have also lost resources. So they don't have as many people to draw from and borrow from. Um, and so, you know, the, the post, post recessional income can take a long, long time to rebuild. Um, so, you know, one thing that gives me a lot of hope is we already see in my mind, a really big difference in terms of who's at the national level. When we were 
fighting for um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars to go at least equally to women. Um, you know, all the women in the legislature, we had to threaten to walk out of the building um, because there, you know, there was such a focus on traditionally male dominated fields, shovel ready projects, and, you know, just the sense that like we need men to get back to work, which we do. Men without jobs, you know, ends up being close to warfare. So, you know, we need them to also have work. But, you know, women suffer really silently and they're 60% or more of the breadwinners in the households or the head of household and supporting children. So, you know, we need them to be well and they just aren't as loud about, you know, their needs. Um, so going into this crisis, um, not going into it actually, since we were in very bad shape with who's at the federal level at that point, but as we're coming out of this crisis, you know, I'm able to quote Janet Yellen on the Senate floor and say, we, you know, our treasury secretary says, if we don't support women in this way, this is exactly what will happen. Having those numbers and figures about women and children, because someone cares at the very top, means a lot to what we have available to us to make our arguments at the state level. So, you know, um, between Janet Yellen and Vice President Kamala Harris and some of the other women we're seeing in leadership roles, we have a lot of voices that we can draw from. And I think one thing in state government that's critical to remember is we're making a lot of decisions about, you know, how to distribute the money that we get from the federal government. Um, but most people can only pay attention to the national level. They can only hear like the national players on the news. They don't really know what we do at the state level. So having folks in Washington saying, this is a she session, women are not doing well. This is how many women have left the workforce. Then I have constituents who are like, how are women doing? What are you doing for women? And I'm like, great, I'm glad you're asking that question. So we have, you know, the wind at our backs as we still are, you know, only seven of 30, um, you know, uh, senators are women. We have our constituents saying, let's focus on women as retirements and pensions are in danger. That's a lot of teachers. That's a lot of women. So we're able to make that argument because we have Washington behind us. Thank you so much. Um, how about our, our two other live speakers? Would you like uh, either of you like to rip off of or add to that? No, I, you know, I thought that was, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think it is something that, you know, we all need to sort of think about both the policies and, and I think, you know, looking at, as someone who's sort of been, been sort of working in the sort of a policy area, we need to sort of think about the direct and the indirect consequences of sort of where things are now. And then I think that's really important for us to be sort of advocates um, of just, just making sure that we're sort of, con you know, sort of thinking about the consequences of recovery and where we are investing, um, who, is, who is getting support, who is needing support. Um, you know, I am sort of very worried about sort of the people who have left, have left the workforce and then are quiet about it and, and making sure that we're thinking about how do we support them. Um, I, you know, I worry about people who are sort of leaving and then want to come back. And so I think one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, in thinking about is how do we think about training and retraining and sort of opening up the door so that when we uh, are sort of encouraging people to sort of re-enter, particularly if they've left right now um, because jobs have changed, how do we have sort of investment in sort of skills and training to help um, sort of bring people back in? Because it's, it's crucial that we have sort of women um, who can sort of re-enter the, the, you know, sort of the workforce if they were, have had to sort of step out, um, either because of childcare or because they've sort of, their industries have really suffered. And so I, I think in particular, it's something that we should be thinking about. Oh, thank you, Lauren. And, and I just thought of something. If any participants on the Zoom want to share, and you know, if you've personally been impacted by things like, um, you know, uh, uh, remote work or um, childcare having to shut down, um, you know, you can share your stories in the chat. Um, I think this crisis also showed us that the public school system is basically childcare for, you know, how much we have to work, how uh, tied we are, you know, into um, the, the like office work and uh, um, that those two go together. Um, they can't really work without the other. Okay, Theo, would you like to add to the um, this topic? Yeah, I'll, I agree with everything that's been mentioned. I'll also add from the perspective of business owners because I work so closely with them. So, um, 
you know, people have to go back to work. Well, how do they go to work if businesses shut down permanently? Um, that's the other side of the equation. So I put in a chat in the chat a link to um, a really striking article that was published around December 1st that said that 37% of the businesses in Massachusetts had closed permanently. Um, that's one in three. That's a really huge number. And so um, businesses run by women are disproportionately more likely to close than, disp than businesses run by men because they gen generally have fewer resources at their disposal. And so when a crisis hits, they don't have the same amount of um, financial stability to help them make it through the crisis. Um, and so one or two examples, I work really closely with a woman named Nicola Williams in Cambridge. She's also a, she's a black business owner, so race is part of the element as well. She um, used to organize really big events and um, we're not having big events now. Um, and so 70% of her revenues have been totally slashed during the pandemic. And so she's on the verge of having to close her business because um, it, it's very hard to keep a business going with such little revenue. Um, and additionally, another example, um, Val Shulak, who runs Basil Tree Catering in Cambridge, and she's an LGBT, a member of the LGBTQ community. So there's that element as well. She has 5% of her revenues currently that as she did, um, let's say this year, last year, or, you know, a year ago before the pandemic. And so it's, it's been very hard, um, especially for women business owners who don't generally have the same resources to keep their businesses going. Um, and, and again, especially hard for people of color um, all, all of these demographics have had a really difficult time amidst COVID and are disproportionately those businesses that are closing. Um, so it's it's been very tough. Um, but yeah, um, policies, you know, policies like um, the the aid that's coming down now from the federal government is very helpful because it it provides resources to these businesses to keep going. Okay, um, thank you. So I uh, as um, we have a few audience questions coming in. And um, maybe I'll just um, throw in one more, um, you know, panelist question while uh, to give you guys a chance to examine the, the audience questions. Um, is there a number one thing you suggest that we as um, Harvard women or a community of Harvard alumni could or should do to um, impact and address this issue of the economic challenges uh, facing women? Sure. Um, so I think that from the perspective of someone who runs um, an independent business alliance, getting involved in organizations that are providing direct assistance to these businesses can be one very helpful avenue for support. Um, so this is, again, from the perspective of trying to support women business owners who disproportionately, disproportionately employ women and um, are vehicles of upward economic mobility for their communities, not just themselves. Um, but there are so many ways to get involved. I'll put a link in the chat. And, and to Mary Ann's question, um, I don't have specific numbers, but I will say one big problem with the PPP when it was first rolled out was that it required that you maneuver or apply to the grant via a pre-existing relationship with a banker. Now, for black owned businesses, we did a study in Cambridge and found that almost all of them had gotten their funds from their community, from their friends and their family. And so they didn't have pre-existing relationships with bankers, which meant that they were just basically disqualified from applying. And so one of the big problems that was later remedied, but initially was a big problem was that the most vulnerable business owners didn't even have access to the application. Yeah, I don't personally um, know the statistics about uh, women owned versus male owned businesses accessing the payroll protection program, but um, I have a feeling women owned businesses are not as highly leveraged, <laughs> which means that their their level of um, debt to um, you know cash holdings. Um, uh, also, one other uh, thing related to women owned businesses and not. Um, women-owned businesses tend to be in services. I went to a New York City um, economic development presentation once, and they said that um, software and technology businesses tend to be owned and founded by men. Women, are, women do own and open tons and tons of businesses, tons, but they do tend to be in services. And the um, profit multiple and scalability in software businesses is higher than services. So um, that that is one, even if a services business is, is very successful, you know, the um, kind of ability, the potential for wealth creation is, is higher with technology. 
Okay, um, great. Any other panelists want to say a suggestion for a, an, act, an action Harvard women alumni could, could take uh, regarding these issues? I mean, I will just add that I think being, it's important for us to sort of just recognize, you know, that and looking out and, you know, the first step is to say, okay, um, both in terms of the big picture and the policy side, but also sort of just in general, how can we help even on sort of smaller scales and supporting and it is, you know, it is thinking very mindfully about the businesses that we're supporting, thinking about the community engagement, thinking about if we are sort of uh, helping connect and support through networks, um, how can we help sort of particularly sort of, you know, women um, and groups that have not had the same network opportunities. I mean, I think one of the things that you find, and we all have found that we benefited um, from sort of the Harvard network overall, and I think that it is um, an opportunity for us to say, okay, we all have that privilege and that, that ability to, to connect. How can we reach out to, in particular, to to groups and to you know, women and to people from backgrounds who have not had the sort of the Harvard name and to sort of boost and amplify. And I would say, you know, that's an action that we could probably all do in our own individual areas as, as sort of as, as, as Harvard uh, alumni women. Um, and so I would, I would recommend that as something just to sort of be conscious of. Mm -hmm. uh, well said, thank you. Yeah, how about uh, Senator Keisha? Yeah, so, you know, I would just add, I think there is, um, I'm getting so many great policy ideas every time I talk to people in my policy network from the Kennedy School and elsewhere. Um, we are full of great ideas and really practicable, um, you know, suggestions on how to help re revive the economy, but do it in a way that's equitable and that brings up those who are struggling the most. But I would say, you know, it's it's really also like I think Harvard and the label and the sort of network we're in, it can be really. Um, stifling, you know, if you're not okay, right? You might feel like I'm I'm looking at all my Harvard friends and they're, you know, passing legislation or they're like look great. You know? And there might be people who are suffering in silence. So I'm really grateful to the people who said like I'm not okay. You know, that's still important. I think there's a concern that, you know, you're supposed to be the ones with the answers because you went to Harvard or whatever, you know, which is we know is just not true. So I think on the one hand, it's important to listen for other people's good ideas who, you know, don't have a fancy degree. And also, you know, really critical to say just because you have a fancy degree, it doesn't mean you're not really struggling to figure out how you survive this or where your path forward will be coming out of it, you know, so I, I have a, had a lot of people in my community say, oh, I did the Kennedy School once upon a time. I'm trying to figure out what's next for me. Can we sit down and talk? You know, it could be at any age. You're just like, how, how do I completely reinvent myself coming into this pandemic? But recognizing that you might not, you might've just depleted your resources and your energy coming through it. It's not like we're all gonna emerge and be happy and fine again, you know? So really checking in with people that you went to school with or in your network to not just be ready to share your good news, but like listen to what they need to emerge successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I think we can let social media and the whole drumbeat of, um, you know, sharing only the highlights obscure a lot of the everyday um, and, and also just, um, you know, a lot of people yeah, in our ranks have been uh, laid off or have businesses suffer. I want to acknowledge um, some of the commenters in the chat. Um, so uh, Yoon Jong Lee mentioned that um, you know she's having some challenges with her um, employment and um, considering a discrimination claim. Um, so I, I would say that um, you know I, I don't want to put pressure on the panelists to, to have to answer answer that per se, but that is a kind of peer to peer question. We would definitely welcome in the ANHW Facebook group and LinkedIn group. There are hundreds of um, fellow Harvardian. Um, members and women in that group. And um, uh, Miss Lee, I'm sure that, um, or Yoon Jung Lee, I, I'm sure that um, if, if you posted in uh, either of our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, you, you might get some uh, helpful leads. And then I want to acknowledge um, Christina's uh, comment as a person who identifies as disabled, I feel very strong, I felt very strongly the impact of marginalization in the economy. I do not represent the disability community, but have felt, um, um, discrimination, unemployment numbers for the disability community are astronomical. Okay, and may, like, maybe let's pause here. Would any of the speakers like to respond to that? And Christina, if you would like to unmute yourself to expand more, feel free to.
Okay, so I'll give a chance, a few seconds for Christina if she'd like to pipe up, if she's still here. I think um, she's on, I think she might be on mute. Do do I, yes. Oh, I'm okay. sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you no, now, please. go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I'm sorry. I became interested in this area a really long time ago because most of my students identified as disabled and I felt that they produced just incredibly inspiring work and um, were often overlooked. So I began to um, attend Fulbright National Conferences and thought about how artists in education were uniquely poised to address uh, possibly different ways of learning. So. Um, I found oftentimes that that work was not really at the forefront of, I think, what should be a national discussion. And I myself have, uh, you know, I, I have a disability and I feel that it's very, very difficult when you do not see other disabled uh, leaders on campus. Uh, so I've been advocating for awareness uh, and visibility. And the employment issue, I feel, is very stark. Uh, the, you know, we really need uh, to address that nationally because it's at about, I think, 19%, if I'm not wrong, for individuals with disabilities as opposed to the larger population. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Yeah, any of speakers like to join? Well, you know, I would just say often we have national statistics, but states don't keep very good data. And so that's just to say, you know, we, for example, in our state, we have seen that women are at 69%, they're 69% of unemployment beneficiaries. Most of the country is 55, 45 at, at best. So I reached out to Jason Furman and I was like, can you help me explain this? Like, what is actually going, going on here in Vermont? Because every state has childcare issues. So then we learned we don't have information disaggregated by disability status, race, age. We have some information on age to show also that there's a lot of people um, on unemployment who are older compared to normal recessions. Um, they've had even less ability to go out and, and be safe doing that. They have, you know, they might have had job stability in other recessions, but in this one, they can't safely go out, so they've lost income. Um, and, you know, that's a huge issue that we have to deal with because those are people who can't retool, who are at the end of, of their um, working career life and now have to figure out how they're going to have a, a fixed, stable income for retirement. So there's a lot of those small pockets of, of data we don't have in the states and we're working really hard to get it, not, you know, to just say, oh, we just need to wait for the data. We, I, you know, I'm sure what you're saying is exactly the case in Vermont but it will help us figure out who are those folks? How do we get them particular entrepreneurial resources? Um, when we, we did a set aside for BIPOC businesses and women owned businesses uh, um, in our recovery funds in the state, and that helped us even know where they were. You know, at the, before that we had no BIPOC business network. We had no idea who needed language access. We had no idea who needed an accommodation. Um, so, you know, we're hopefully, I keep saying like we're in, the one gift of this crisis is that it's unfolding slowly. It's not like a flood, you know, where it's like, oh, we lost those folks because we were never good at taking care of other people who are usually left behind in disasters. This one's slow moving. We have time to talk to people. So I actually did a study where we called people in mobile home parks, migrant farm workers, people with disabilities. That was even hard with people with disabilities. Similarly to, we have a lot of internet issues in Vermont. So some people, it was like, I don't have the internet. Can call me on the phone. We need to use a special, you know, communication tool to speak. You know, I, I don't have any transportation. I don't have anywhere to go. I don't, I can't, someone can't come to my house to help. So it was like, wow, I'm, you know, and we would pay those folks to talk to them about what they were going through. And so, you know, I think that like the one-on-one, -on -one, the mutual aid, I had a lot of young people say, I'm home from college. Like, what should I do? I'm like, go find five neighbors who need help and help them. Like, this isn't a time to be a hero or start a new organization. Like, go literally help the older people and the people who can't get out of their house right now you know so i think that's sometimes what gets lost is we're like how do we like be build back better and it's like well we some people can't ask that question right now because they they weren't doing okay before you know so um yeah that's all to say we've had to really reach out to those populations so we don't do something for them without knowing that it's what they actually want and need thank you 
Okay, how about Lauren or uh, Theodora about disabilities and the disabled community? I mean, I, I would just echo, you know, as a data person, I will say getting good information is important. Uh, there's a great book I'd recommend uh, called Invisible Women. I don't know if any of you have heard of heard this book. It's uh, by so a, a British author, uh, Caroline Cleto Perez, and it's great. And one of the things that she does, and I thought it was really powerful, is she talks about you know, what are the assumptions you have and the information that's being collected? Because if you're not asking the question properly, you're not going to get the right, um, you know, it's a full answer and you're going to miss and you're going to jump to the wrong conclusions. Um, so I think this is about, first of all, how do you how do you get good policy evaluations of the policies that you have? Are you addressing some of the core problems? Um, I think that's, you know, one of, one, of, one of the things we need to be thinking about from a policy perspective. Do we have successful um, you know, successful sort of things that have worked in other locations that we want to sort of fund and bring into, you know, different settings. And I think, you know, this is really, it's is an opportunity now um, to sort of really think about, you know, who, where are we, where are our gaps? Um, and, and I think, you know, we have a, a huge challenge, but I think that in terms of the conversations, we've moved along a lot in the past, you know, year and a year, year and a bit. Um, and I think we have the opportunity to just sort of think about things um, and make sure we're not missing groups as we sort of think about um, sort of you know, making sure that we're addressing and sort of creating sort of these economic opportunities and and not leaving anyone behind. So um, that's sort of what I would just sort of would make a plug for the book. It's a great book. Yeah, I just looked it up. It sounds incredible. I added it to my to read list. Um, Christina, I'll, I'll give two, in, in addition to the, the emphasis on, on data collection, I think that's a really good point. Um, just two anecdotes to, to further validate your point. Um, my best friend from childhood teaches uh, low functioning autistic children, middle school children in elementary middle school in the Seattle public schools. And my sister is a student, uh, is a, a teacher of middle school, middle school students who also have additional needs in the classroom. Um, and both of them have commented repeatedly over the last year to me how challenging it has been for them beyond the challenges that other teachers are facing to provide the, the resources to their students that, that they need. Um, in fact, it's been almost impossible. And so um, it, it, this is an anecdote in the context of, of students who are trying to learn, and these are students who have um, significantly greater needs than, than the average student. Um, they have been dispar way disproportionately affected um, by COVID. Already they were under-resourced and overworked. Um, and, and to be trying to do high quality service delivery to these students during COVID has basically been impossible. Um, and so what I put in the chat was that like I think uh, Representative Catherine Kirk said, the pandemic has really exacerbated all pre-existing inequalities. I mean, it's so true, especially in the context of people who have disabilities, who, who have additional challenges in accessing um, resources. It's It's been very difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry for the experience that you've had. It's um, it's not surprising, but it's it's terrible to hear. Um, and we're here if we, if we can provide any resources to you, of course, we're happy to do so. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much for commenting, Christina. And I think that like this speaks to the power of the Harvard Women's Network too, that like we can directly raise these issues to each other, bring light to um, issues that, um, you know, our um, typical leaders may not be thinking about um, day to day or emphasizing as headline issues. Um, okay, so as, as we're, um, you know, moving along with the panel, I was wondering, um, would you like to comment on how um, you know gender equity issues have impacted your career, um, you know, or if you'd like to um, talk about how um, if it's been challenging to engage men in either your work or your career path um, about gender equity and policy, you know, I think that it would be a Miss, it would be incomplete to have a Women's History Month Zoom and not acknowledge that um, you know men exist also, and that we are in a world with them and need to work with them. Um, I'll, I'm happy to start on this. Um, so uh, I am a founding member of a group called Women in Transport, um, and we set up this network. Uh, actually, at the suggestion of you know, sort of a, a male sort of mentor of mine, who said, "Look, you know, this is a way for you to sort of create 
uh, your equivalent of what's the old boys club here. You know, how do you sort of get women together to support and to help each other in transport because it is an underrepresented industry um, and and build that. And it was actually was for the, our London chapter, it was based initially on sort of a, uh, the US group WTS. And so that was sort of our model. We were affiliated with them for a while. And now we are our own group that we have. Uh, we just launched our chapter in uh, in Scotland on Thursday, which is very exciting. Um, and so we are sort of a network of women who've done sort of uh, training um, and mentoring and connections. But what has been really important and has really sort of helped us succeed is that we have uh, a number of sort of men who are you know, equally you know, sort of working with us to champion you know, sort of this. And it is, we have men who are on our board, we have, um, it, they are sort of providing and are sort of are signed up to sort of to donate their time and their efforts to sort of address what has been, you know, a, a sort of a, a long standing um, perception of an industry of being a blokey, um, you know, sort of men's industry of men in men driving trains, men in hard hats doing construction. And so all the things that we can do to sort of to change the culture and change the way that this feels as a as a place for sort of women has been uh, has been important. And actually having men there too to sort of support us as we do that has been uh, very important. I mean, and the other side of this, of course, is is thinking about sort of the obligations that you know so women face in childbearing years and not making this about just a child a child being a woman's issue but have, thinking about child care as a sort of a, a a community issue and a parenting issue um you know and we, as we talked earlier about some of the sort of the schooling and some of the challenges this is a you know child care is, is a is a sort of a broad uh you know not a sort of a narrow issue it's an issue of sort of thinking of the future and it's it's one that is that the more that i think that we can sort of frame it as a problem that's a that's an, a broader problem um the better off we are downstream but of course we do have to remember that you know it is important because um you know women right now are doing a lot of the child caring and we can't lose that fact either so um that's sort of my my optimistic answer about saying how do we sort of get uh get men engaged thank you i would just say so actually you know as lauren keeps using funny British saying some things. I just have to say, my aunt um, is in the House of Lords, actually. Um, and she was the first South Asian woman appointed to the House of Lords. She was the mayor of Windsor. She had been a refugee counselor for women and girls. She was the mayor of Windsor. And then Margaret Thatcher was like, you're really a good mayor of Windsor. And we have lots of events here, obviously, and need lots of security and coordination. And so she appointed her to the House of Lords. And you know, um, we both share a common ancestor. His, his name is Sir Ganga Ram. And I'm actually like, so I've, I've been the subject of like hugely viral tweets in what is now Pakistan because he was such an incredible philanthropist at the turn of the last century. And he, um, you know, when he was uh, kind of doing his work as an engineer and architect there, it was part of India. So my family's, you know, Indian pre partition. Um, but he, not only built, you know, hospitals at, that had a mobile universal medical component and roads and bridges and irrigation systems and things, but he specifically put his money into uh, schools for girls, colleges for women and homes for widows. And that was like 120 years ago in what is now Pakistan. And so I'm often trying to re remind people that I talk to when I get this kind of international audience that it's not like the West is in any way the leader in women's empowerment. <laughs> you know, we all take turns having huge steps backwards and huge steps forward. But the, the, you know, many Indians would say that during the Victorian period in British rule is when they lost a lot of gender equity in India um, and, this, and Southern India being less touched by that, that Victorian attitude has a lot more gender parity than Northern India. So, you know, we also have to remember that we have other cultures to look to um, and it's not like in no way Western culture <laughs> should be our standard for this. And I, I, I find that very much empowers women around the world to think like you don't have to be Western in order to to, to do this, you know, because that's actually probably not a great idea, honestly, at the end of the day, there's a, there are better ways to do it or just different ways to do it for, for your own cultures. So, you know, that's been really helpful. And then I often talk about my own multicultural immigrant story growing up in California as being made possible by Asian student visas that allowed Asian students to go study in the US, which only started happening in the 60s. So people forget like 
if women and people of color aren't allowed to get student visas or have mobility, multicultural people like me don't exist. And then when my parents went to, they, owned, they had an Indian restaurant and then they opened an Irish pub. So my Jewish mother and my Indian father had an Irish pub in Los Angeles. And the capital that they got to open that as an immigrant and a woman was from the Women's Bank of Los Angeles, which when I went as a kid, I thought, I just like this bank because it's full of women who give me candy and like put me on the counter. This is great. But it was actually a bank that was designed to be friendly to families and friendly to women and give them loans when nobody else was giving them capital. And we forget that a lot of women fought these battles before us and made it possible for us to have what we have. And we think, oh, we don't need that anymore, which is just not not true, you know, so we could also look to these past ideas. And finally, I would just say, you know, I, I, I definitely needed male mentors to be where I am today. You know, I needed men to also see that it's important for women to lead they couldn't just be like, oh, you seem great. And I don't, I, I'm getting past the fact that you're a woman. No, they have to care that you're a woman. They have to see that your leadership is valuable because you're a woman and or a person of color. What, we had a speaker in the, in the house the whole time I was there um, who was a mentor of mine. And he and I had other political issues down the road, but that besides that, when he was my mentor, you know, he would, people would say, oh, Shap, you know, 10 out of the 11 members of your appropriations committee are women. And he'd say, yeah, because they actually just write the budget. You know, they, they know that children need to eat and that rivers need to be cleaned. And, you know, they don't grandstand, they don't take hostages. They get up every day, they go to work early and they write the budget, you know? And it was really powerful for a man to be saying that, that like, if we're gonna get a budget that makes sense, I need women at the table, which is so different than, you know, a hundred years of history of men you know, being like, women don't have a head for numbers or whatever. He's like, I'm not putting men on that committee, you know? So it was just like really starting to change the attitude and, and demonstrate that women actually have unique capabilities when you put them in groups together to get things done. I love that. Um, I would echo the emphasis on mentoring. Um, I think that men have played a very important role in my growth and my development. Um, Two men offered me my first two jobs out of college and also my first job after grad school um, and have continued to, to offer me opportunities, um, provide meaningful guidance to me as I'm facing different challenges in my career um, and, and support me financially too. The first person who gave to my campaign was someone who donated $2,000. Um, his wife donated and he donated, um, but he was the one who, who was the supporter um, and that got me started and he was so excited to write that check um, and I was excited to receive that check. <laughs> um, but I, I found that that men want to be by and large, by and large, not every man, but 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 mostly I have found that men want to be advocates for the women in their lives. Um, and so when I have found that when I have given them that opportunity um, to grow with me, because often there's co-learning that's involved. It's not just that they are, you know, they're pulling me up, but but I'm also helping them along the way too. I'm I'm sharing my perspectives with them, and and I'm giving them a broader perspective on issues that they might not have had a broader perspective on. So, what's nice is that it, you know, co-generational. I like the or intergenerational collaboration. It applies with men too, um, and it's nice because the co-learning it, it can work in both directions. Um, so I have found that men have been huge advocates for me and, and part of my success is absolutely due to them to to them you know i i definitely think that i i'm you know i might not have been as compensated as my male counterparts might have been in in certain spaces at certain times and i absolutely recognize that um mm -hmm. there are challenges i i um there was a panel that um let's see and michelle organized last saturday and one of the comments that really resonated and i got so annoyed when i heard this was that women are given you know, promotions one step at a time. And men are just told to like, they, you know, oh, you wanna do this thing you've never done before? Sure, go ahead, do it. Um, and, and definitely I found that like, I have come up against that where I've, I've often had to prove that I can do something if it's not just one incremental step up. And the example was Pete Buttigieg, who's now secretary of transportation, you know, I guess he's qualified because he got engaged in an airport. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how men are given these huge opportunities and often women have to fight just to move incrementally. So I've definitely noticed that, but I will say that I, I'm very grateful to the men who've, who've been advocates for me and, and supportive of me. And I think that they're, they're part of this journey. 
Thank you. I want to acknowledge and mention one of the questions um, specifically in the chat um, from Joan um, directed at Lauren. Uh, how did you identify the men to join your board? That, that's a great question. We have actually we have two on our board at the moment. Um, one of them was actually someone who came to us who does a lot of uh, sort of coaching and and training and a sort of and uh, and it came onto our board after having been a volunteer with us um, and then said okay you know he wanted we were sort of looking at our board structure and, um, and women in transport and he said okay this is something I can help you do because I you know I want to give back and, and help grow uh, grow through the organization and so that was one uh, we do also have um a one of our sort of really enthusiastic sort of board board members who actually um came um from our operations uh, operational side so he it basically trains um trains people to sort of to do sort of transport operations and you know he did does not you know he, 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 he has a background where where he he looks like a real operations guy you know you, you just if you walk down the street you wouldn't necessarily sort of have sort of picked him to someone to be on a board but, but he has been you know an absolute champion um, you know they're just doing a lot of the work um, you know, sort of being a volunteer um, helping set up events when we were having in-person events he would do just uh, just sort of be the person to sort of do do various different setup take pictures take sort of names and sort of the lists help make things just happening and just sort of pitching into help um, helping us sort of run of run events and sort of teaching about you know what he would sort of have it take us to the sites where he was working and sort of did demonstrations and so having just someone on the ground who wants to sort of be involved and, and broaden the um, broaden the experience? Um, it was really helpful for us, and so um, we did sort of recognize that after a number of years of, of not having men on the board, that it actually really is helpful to sort of get that get that perspective um, and to sort of help advocate for us as well. So that's how that's how we have sort of our our board set up. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, so we're gonna um, let the program run for about another 15 minutes. And um, I've not received an update from um, the Boston City Councilor Michelle Wu. Uh, so hopefully she will still be able to join, but she is running her um, campaign for her uh, mayor of Boston right now. So, um, you know, a emergency or other um, commitments may have um, impacted her schedule, but her um, chief of staff, definitely sent um, their regards and um, said that she, she would try to join. Um, so let's um, go to audience questions um, and anyone who would like to um, unmute yourself to ask a question directly to the panelists, please feel free. Um, and while people are getting ready to do that, I want to um, you know, give a heartfelt thanks to um, and Michelle Kamamoto Perry and uh, Litsi Kurenskalt for um, collaborating with me for the past two months on, on the Women's History Month programming. Uh, the boards of W3D uh, Women in Defense, Diplomacy and Development and the HKS Women's Network are really phenomenal partners. Um, and the ANHW Alumni Network for Harvard Women um, loves working with them. Okay, any audience questions? Yes, I I like to ask about this particular situation at Northeastern University, and I was teaching there two courses, and and as a female Asian professor in engineering school, it is well known that we are discriminated. But when I give this constructive feedback about the student engineering project in group presentation uh, session. Whenever I gave feedback on, on some design, this student just kept sending unjustified complaints anonymously to the administration, totally unjustified. And after a few times, I contacted engineering dean, asked what to do, and they said it was concerning and filed an official claim to the equality office, and which I did. And two days later, the department chair terminated me saying, I refused to with, meet with her to discuss it, which was not actually fact. I, I provided all the evidence on the course website and willing to provide more emails and witness. And that was not the reason. On top of that, they didn't even pay my salary. And, and it 
This one happened when this Asian female killing happens in Atlanta and the next Monday, only a two days later, this kind of a thing happens. And I mm. mean, this is totally unbelievable. And I, and as um, an expert Professor in this Lee. field and former, yeah. Uh, I, I, I recognize that um, that was really, really traumatizing to both um, get this, um, you know, ha have this workplace incident um, impact you and at the same time, all the national news and um, the Atlanta spa shooting, of course, it, it deeply impacted me personally. Um, and I, I understand how painful um, that is. Um, but however, it sounds like you have a very specific legal issue. Um, and I think that, um, it's best for an employment lawyer to um, be able to get all of the facts. Um, so through um, the Harvard, um, you know, women's, um, the, the ANHW Facebook group, LinkedIn group, and the different um, HKSWN resources that um, Theodore mentioned, there might be a, a way to find a lawyer to connect with you. And it is best if lawyers can help because they have the most technical knowledge, um, you know, um, and will be most equipped to, to help you. Okay, thank you though for, for bringing up this um, issue. I, I understand that it's, it's um, definitely impacting your day to day. Um, okay, would anyone else like to ask any questions about our speakers, especially regarding you know, um, leadership or um, women in politics and policy? I would just sort of uh, um, address what we just heard a little bit. I'm so sorry for your situation to say that um, I've advocated a lot for greater technical assistance from our state's sort of um, various agencies and departments, whether it's human services or commerce and community development. Um, you know, often women and women of color, um, when they try to access legal supports and technical resources, they're charged more for less work. Um, you know, they end up feeling really cheated. Um, we have like one black owned farm in the state and they just brought a human rights commission case because of everything they're going through. And people are like, why don't we have more land ownership for people of color? And it's like, it's really hard to have assets um, and be able to maintain them as a woman of color. People are constantly trying to take them away from you um, and, and cheat you out of it because they know there's less support for you at the end of the day. So I just wanna affirm that, you know, you're, you're not alone, even if that's cold comfort, that a lot of people um, may go through what, what you go through and it's gonna still have to be local resources that help you, but it's okay to ask in larger spaces. Cause when people ask me that in Vermont, I'm like, I'm gonna go find you a lawyer from a lot of well-meaning white people who say they wanna help. Like, again, I go back to, you know, it's one thing to start an organization or whatever. It's another to just say, what skills do you have? Cause if you have a skill, I have someone who needs help. You know, if you're an accountant or a lawyer or whatever you can help somebody, you know? So I, I can't help you in Massachusetts. I think other people can, but I hope you'll follow up because you're, you're not alone in what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100% agree, yes. And um, the, the, the Women's Network, you know, is, is really, really strong in Boston. Um, actually, Michelle Wu is a Harvard alum and law school alum herself. And being, I think, you know, she represents you. So um, reaching out to her office may also be a good way to um, link up to, to these employment and discrimination resources. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, um, I wanted to acknowledge, you know, the discussion about the men's role in gender equity, and um, Esther Perel is a famous um, a psychologist um, and, and speaker right now, and um, there was something great she's uh, said before about how um, one of the riches, um, one of the uh, great benefits um, that has happened for men in terms of social change is that um, fatherhood has become a much more emotionally rich experience and expectation for men. It used to be not very long ago that um, the, the worth of a father is just, are you a breadwinner? <laughs> and, you know, just like your economic, your financial contribution is all that's like uh, required and expected. And if you don't measure up, 
then you're not a good father. And now that's expand. Now, um, you know, the um, even though there has been a lot of social disruption and not all men have been, um, you know, receiving that very smoothly, the, um, the benefit of them like having a fuller role in the family and more emotional role is something that, um, you know, is, um, all of us do benefit from. So that, um, you know, what Lauren said about the like, family and um, employment and, you know, making a society that's um, more, um, you know, acclimated to the contributions of both parents. I think that that's one way to really get people to, all people to the, the gender equity um, discussion table. Um, okay, well, if there are no other questions from the audience, I'm wondering, um, how do Can we- I ask a question? Oh, sure, yes. <laughs> I broached your topic, because there's one, one of the things that I would like to sort of have a little bit of time spent on um, is sort of exploring climate. Because um, even you mentioned at the start, you know, you sort of when uh, thinking about how do you sort of work in, in policy or you know, work practically on, on things like public transport, as I do, uh, climate is, is a part. And one of the things, and again, as we think thought about what do we do as Harvard women, one of the things that I've been trying to do very mindfully in my set discussions um, you know, with all sorts of people is talk about climate, because I think that's something that's really important. And so I wondered if we could just spend sort of a moment or two and think about either you know how how we in particular want to think about climate and the impact on on women and also particularly and thinking about sort of communities that are that have don't have as much sort of much power um sort of both worldwide or both sort of, sort of domestically in the u.s um, and just sort of reflect on whether there's anything in, in particular that that either we or whether anybody from the audience audience has wants to sort of add um but i just didn't want to lose the opportunity of talking with uh with other harvard women uh, about that as well um, so I'll pose the question and then I'll give you my thoughts if, um, uh, as well on that too, if that's okay. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that into the discussion. We're all on this one planet, <laughs> not really getting off of this planet that soon. Yeah, I, I was vice chair of the Natural Resources and Energy Committee in the House and I, um, I asked to go to the economic development uh, general and housing affairs. I forget what my committee's called, but it's like all the economic issues are on my committee. And, um, you know, I am, um, I, I was an environmental justice scholar. So I care a lot about all these intersections and where they meet public health, which I imagine you do too with transportation. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think there's a lot of people with privilege who talk about climate and there's a lot of people without privilege who talk about health and they're really talking about the same thing. Um, but, you know, we make the conversation way too gourmet a lot of the times, as I like to say up here. Um, and so I'm constantly, you know, trying to bring it back to who has terrible indoor air quality in a pandemic, who's heating their house with a space heater and their stove, who's has black mold in their basement, you know, who can't make it to a doctor's appointment or the grocery store. Um, because they don't have reliable transportation. Why do the bus stops running at 3 p.m. in our rural communities? So, you know, it's a lot of like it, flood resilience. So the EPA just put flood data on our mapping tool to see who's in a more distressed community. Vermont is, has very flood prone areas. 40% of um, the people affected in our last major flooding event, Hurricane Irene, live in mobile home parks, but they're only 8% of the population otherwise. So, you know, there's huge problems for low income communities and communities of color. Vermont's one of the last states that doesn't have an environmental justice policy on the books. So, and we have this climate council and I've been like, I was like battling with the climate council and now I'm like, they come to me for everything, which is also a problem, <laughs> but they had one person of color on this large climate council in the state. And it was, you know, and, the, and they had no stipends for people to participate, asking people for a lot of time. So even the one farmer on the climate council was like, I can't keep doing this. I'm not getting paid to be here like the environmental folks. So if, if people who really call themselves like capital E environmentalists and climate activists don't think about how everyone is able to participate, they will fail like they we, we will fail because we'll all fail because we you know but the pandemic should have taught us that there are so many people we're already leaving behind and people are like well let's vote like we have to do better in climate it's like well yeah but, but you have to listen to the people who are left behind in the pandemic to mm -hmm. know how to do a better job in the climate emergencies that we're about to face yeah. and so 
I'm constantly like when I go to our climate caucus, et cetera, I'm like, I'm not just a brown face who says the same things you do. Like being committed to environmental justice means, means being committed to walkable, dense, transportation rich communities. And some of you don't like that. And I'm going to fight you, you know? So like we have to be clear that the, that in the environmental movement has to work for everyone. And that means kind of you know, upsetting and, and ruffling the feathers of a lot of wealthy environmentalists who don't want to change their perspective mm -hmm. of what that means. Yeah, I love that you brought the intersection of class into the discussion. Um, thank you, Senator Acacia. Uh, okay, so uh, a special guest just joined us and uh, I want to let her right. introduce herself. Um, city of Boston, city councilor at large, Michelle Wu and um, current candidate for mayor, um, AB07, HLS12. Um, thank you for joining our discussion for Women's History Month. Hi, everyone. And hi, Vivian. <laughs> hi, so, hi. Good to see you again. Yeah. It's been a while um, since Chinatown ACDC meeting. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah. it's, I'm, I'm just so honored to be with you all. I'm sorry I'm kind of caught between various events on the, on the campaign trail, but I wanted to stop by and just thank you for all that you are doing to continue to elevate uh, this conversation, women's leadership, the intersectionality of all the issues uh, that we are facing right now in, in a moment of crisis in our country. And so um, I am running for mayor in Boston in a, a really pivotal moment for our city um, from, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't able to be on for the whole time, but oh, no, from, okay. um, uh, maybe we can just uh, catch you up on some of the themes and hear your reaction, how you are, um, you know, dealing with these themes as, as you're launch as you're in the midst of your live um, campaign. Um, we were talking about the um, economic losses being disproportionately felt by women. Uh, what's policy's role or response um, to that? And also, um, you know, how to involve gender uh, men more in the gender equity conversation. Um, or, you know, any thoughts about uh, climate equity? Absolutely. And um, from what I heard from this, the senator right before, uh, completely agree on um, how we need to make sure that the climate movement and, and our push for climate justice does um, connect with, with the, the movements for racial justice and, and economic justice as well. You know, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how the economic recovery should go in Boston and in cities everywhere. We know that a huge reason why there's been such a disproportionate impact on women in terms of the job losses of this pandemic is because we have seen just a collapse of the uh, support structures and you know the, the sort of barely being held together previously completely collapsed in terms of the care infrastructure schools being closed and shut down, childcare being shut down uh, completely for a period. And so, um, we, sorry, I'm on the road. Um, this should be the impetus for us to really rethink how we wanna build this critical infrastructure moving forward. What is the role of early education and care? How do we uh, change the dynamic so that we are one, removing the barrier for families who are unable to afford childcare in this moment um, and prior to the pandemic, as well as the early ed workforce, which is predominantly women of color who are um, vastly, vastly underpaid in, in just a completely unsustainable way. And so we need to be thinking about what public goods are in this moment and uh, what we've all gone through over the, the last year and especially sitting on the shoulders of our black and brown and immigrant communities should be a wake up call to, to say, these issues were already a crisis point before, let's actually get it right on the policy side now, invest in the infrastructure um, and build it so that we will be resilient to any future shocks like this moving forward. Yeah, Michelle, um, do you think there's a number one thing that we as a Harvard women alumni community um, should do to uh, address um, economic issues impacting women? So I would say um, first on the advocacy side, this, you know, we need every voice at the table, whatever platform you have in bring these issues when you reach out on the policy side to uh, legislators to, uh, you know, at the federal level, all the, all the way down to the local level. We need to be pushing for this momentum to continue. Um, in Boston, 
I put forward a plan to close the early education and childcare gap with universal pre-K. We're hoping that this will dovetail with groundbreaking state legislation around access to affordable early education and care, the um, infrastructure packages that President Biden has put forward so far. Uh, but these are all plans and proposals in, in reaction to a groundswell of awareness in this moment. We need the, the push and the momentum to make it actually happen and, and turn into policy that's implementable. So everyone has a role in reaching out to their local elected officials. at your organization, tell your story of what it has been like. Tell your story of why this matters and the many ways in which our um, intersectional identities need to be lifted up so that we're, we're pushing for change and policy that responds to um, the, the, the actual needs because we're often not counted in so much of the data, right? Communities of color are not as, as included. Um, often working parents are not um, included in, in, in the data and the numbers. So uh, make sure that we, in, in all ways, are heard, are seen, um, and having those stories really makes a difference. Okay, thank you. I really like that we're using that theme to um, help to close out. Like All of us can and need to uh, tell our stories, advocate for ourselves. Sorry. I was... um, yeah, maybe just one last thing. What's it like running for mayor as a woman candidate and that there's never been a woman mayor before in Boston? Frozen. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Councilor. Sorry, Vivian, I have a cellular dead spot. So, I... oh. um, so it, it's it's too. Am I frozen as well? No, you're good. Okay. You're good. <laughs> I think they're both frozen. <laughs> well, there's only two people frozen right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's two thirty. So, um, oh, Vivian, are you back on? I was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, but thank you for taking it. Yeah, I think we, we have to call a, a lid on it pretty much. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about my technical glitches. No worries. Um, okay, well, thank you all so much for joining. And I, I felt like this was a very important and wide ranging conversation from disability to climate, you know, to gender equity. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you to the, our, um, you know, speakers for um, having the courage to run for office because, you know, you're definitely in a minority in a small vaunted group of um, Harvard Women alumni. We want to support you. Thank you for representing us. Mm. Thanks, and everyone on this call should run for office too. Theo's Right Emerge is a great program. And Michelle, a lot of us are cheering for you. I went to a fundraiser of yours where you were breastfeeding your child. And I just think you're, you know, um, what many of us aspire to be in terms of showing people that it's all possible and it all matters um, and that you can also take time for yourself and, and be a badass. So thanks for what you're doing. I mean so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. And let's, uh, let's uh, see each other on Facebook and LinkedIn in our virtual communities. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.